Welcome to Debut Spotlight. I'm Rachel Barenbaum, and today I am out of this world excited for my guest. She is unbelievable. Chanda Prescott-Weinstein is just amazing and brilliant, and I loved her book, The Disordered Cosmos, and I can't wait for her to tell us all about it. Tell me, Chanda, what is your book about? My book is a holistic look at the doing of particle physics and cosmology. So it goes from what's exciting and compelling about understanding the origin and evolution of space-time and pretty much everything inside of it, like what's a quark, what's a lepton, what is the dark matter problem, uh, all the way through to the problems that we face in trying to do physics and organize the physics community, including how people are treated in the physics community and beyond. <laughs> and all of those super heavy, massive subjects summed up beautifully, right, in your pages. Um, so I want to start off by uh, talking to you about how you've defined yourself as a Black, queer, and Jewish woman, also a theoretical particle cosmologist. Um, so basically, in my head, I think of you as studying anything that's not on Earth, right? And I think you've said that too. And yet, um, your identity here on Earth has really shaped a lot of, um, you know, what you study and how you study it, and it's put up barriers. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the first thing to say is that all of those identities are human identities. They're social identities, uh, ascribed identities. Like, they're not ones that were necessarily, like, genetically coded with in any sense, right? Um, and so there is, like, the actual universe which is like doing its thing, stars are exploding, neutron stars are being formed, gases are coalescing and, and forming protostars. You can tell I really like stars. <laughs> so that's all happening. And then there is the human practice of trying to make sense of it and tell a story through um, math. And that's the practice of physics, but that's a, it's a human practice. And so I think that that's a really important thing to keep in mind that there is the universe and then there's what we're trying to understand and our very human process of doing it. Um, the funny thing about what I do is that, for example, the solar system is both like too big and too small for me. <laughs> So what I mean by that is that I study like the very, very small, like subatomic particles and their connections to the very, very large. So um, neutron stars, which are like maybe the size of a city um, and up to um, galaxies. But I'm mostly interested in the connections between the very small and the very large like galaxies and galaxy clusters. So I'm not necessarily your go-to person for conversations, for example, about the Perseverance rover that's on Mars. <laughs> Cosmologists can be quite ignorant about planetary science stuff. But I love that you've really taken your book and your work takes these questions, right, about the solar system, the universe, whether it right, be dark matter, whatever it is, and really addresses the language, right, the connection um, that we use to talk about it. And as a writer myself, right, this is what I love, that you question things like the use of dark matter, right? And someone asked you once, what would a Black person think about calling a Black hole a Black hole, right? Um, and, and sort of asking the questions of what does language do is translated, because you talk about let's translate these ideas through math, and then there's another layer of then add language on top of it. And that's really what you talk about. And I, I love that. Could you talk about it? <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, even when I say like we're telling the story using math, right, there there, I think there's almost like a philosophical debate about how much math is fundamental to the universe in some sense that exists outside of humanity and how much of it is just like, you know, us starting with some axioms, some assumptions, and then deriving what those assumptions must imply if we assume that they are true. And so again, this all comes back to the question of how much of this is human storytelling. And I think in some sense, part of what I was hoping to do with the book, or part of what I hope the book at least partially accomplishes, is making the case for science as a form of storytelling. And I'm getting away from that bifurcation of there's the humanities where people think about stories, there's literature where people think about stories, and then there's science where people think about facts, that we're always thinking about different ways of understanding the way that the, the, the universe works and different aspects of how the universe works. And what I like to point people to is 
when we think about children asking the question why, which hopefully, um, particularly for those of us who are Jewish, right, it's embedded in our annual Passover tradition that you actually have, um, you know, kids who are supposed to be asking you different iterations of the question why. Um, when kids ask those questions, they're not saying, oh, this is a literature question and this is a physics question. They're just looking at the world and trying to figure out what is the world around me? Why does it work the way that it does? And so I think in some sense, we have to keep that, that childlike mindset of not making those distinctions. The disciplinary boundaries that then start to evolve are actually human constructions. We make those decisions and they change with time. Um, a good example of this is the American Physical Society, which is my primary professional society, originally wouldn't allow people who do what is now called solid state physics or condensed matter physics into the society. They were like, that's not real physics. It is now the case in 2021 that the annual American Physical Society meeting that focuses on condensed matter physics is like an order of magnitude larger than the one that focuses on particle physics and cosmology and the areas that are considered the traditional, traditional areas of physics. Um, so even our understanding of what these words mean changes through time within the scientific community and language plays a huge role in that. And so part of what I wanted to do in this book was, was think that through. I love that. So um, actually my novels, um, well, my first novel, A Bend in the Stars, talks about Einstein and the theory of relativity and the race to prove relativity. And people ask me all the time, right, oh, you must study physics. You must know a lot of math. And I always say, actually, I don't, but <laughs> I love science and I love the philosophy side, right? Einstein started with a lot of thought experiments, right? And saying, can we see this? And so I love that you're talking about, let's talk about science with words that you know can be stories that we can all understand. You don't have to understand the equations right on the board. That's just beautiful. Um, I also love, and I think that it reflects your love of storytelling in the fact that your academic appointment is both on the science side and the women's studies and gender studies side. How do you bring those two, um, two appointments together? Yeah, I think that this book is, is that experiment in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, so much of my thinking about these questions about language and the social side of how science happens is rooted in feminist philosophy of science and also in critical race theory and understanding that race and gender structure the social world around us. Physics, the doing of physics is part of that social world. And so that structuring comes into play in the scientific community. So I think that you know, my, my work on feminist philosophy of science, I think really helps me better understand the context in which I do my particle physics research. And I think it also influences the way that I run my research group. How can it not? Um, I think a lot more, I think consciously than maybe my, my, uh, my colleagues in physics and in particle physics about you know, what am I doing when I have a particular conversation with a student? What, um, how does the community work? Even small things like I have read Sharon Trawick's Beam Times and Lifetimes, with, which is an anthropological study of particle physicists, several times because I do science, technology, and society studies. Most of my particle physics colleagues have never read an anthropological study of our own community. And I have to say, like, it's unfortunate because the book is actually a pretty insightful guide into how to be successful in the field. Because Sharon, as an outsider, looked at what are the dynamics that actually affect people's career trajectories in a way that we just don't have good insight or insight into. Um, I love the story of how you came to uh, learn that you could spend your life studying black holes, right? That you went and then saw this. Actually, could you tell me that story? You know how you went to see that movie? Yeah. So I, my mom took me to see Errol Morris's documentary, A Brief History of Time, which is about Stephen Hawking, has the same name as uh, Stephen Hawking's famous book. And I was 10 years old. And I thought it was like super and cool that we were going to see a documentary. We were basically poor, so she could only afford a matinee. It cost her a bunch of gas money to even drive to the West Side to go to the movie theater. I'm from Los Angeles, from East Los Angeles. And I'm, so I was like really primed to be miserable and to be totally disinterested. And I was like completely fascinated the entire time. And halfway through the documentary, Stephen Hawking was talking about trying to figure out 
what happens at the center of a black hole. And he said that Einstein's theory of relativity didn't explain it and that we actually, that Einstein hadn't been able to work it out. And what I got from this, you know, as a poor kid who was like, I need to have a job one day, like I'm, I loved math, that I could get paid to do math all day that would allow me to work on figuring out things that Einstein couldn't. Like, why wouldn't I want that job? <laughs> that seemed like, that was like, I was like, this is it. I'm sold. Where do I go? How do I get started? And that was, that was literally my attitude was how do I get started? <laughs> And you wrote to him and asked that. Yeah, I wrote you? to him. I and asked that. One of his graduate students replied and said, you have to go to a top university and then you get a PhD and then you become a professor. And in a lot of ways, the story that I tell in the book about what the physics community is and how it functions is me reflecting on, you know, the simplicity of that story and how, yes, it's true. And also it's like totally not true because it was also like, and you'll have to jump through all of these racist tubes and all of these sexist tubes. And, you know, you'll get into a good university, but then when you get there, people are going to tell you, you were an affirmative action case and that you hadn't actually earned your spot there. And so it wasn't just like get into mm -hmm. Harvard and get a Harvard degree, but it was get into Harvard and survive getting a Harvard degree and have enough emotional energy to keep going into graduate school. And wow. so I think in some sense, I wanted to write this book for people to have something that says there are challenges along the way, but also keep going because the stuff is exciting. Um, I want to switch gears, though, to a little bit more of a serious side of your work, which is there is a philosophical um, and sort of, uh, you know, conundrum, right, and bigger questions to the work, because you talk about how the government is funding your work, right, and then some of it has come out of research done for the Manhattan Project and for weapons, right, and some of your work and theories and ideas might be used as weapons that then the police, for example, might use, right, against crowds or, you know, protesters, right, and so there are these ramifications of the work that you do um, and that you can't work in a vacuum. You have to ask, right, what's going to happen to this and face those questions. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think a really big gap in education right now is that we are not equipping students with the tools to think about the ethical questions that might arise in their lives and in their work. Um, it's very easy. I think a, a good example, I'll pick a supernovae. So supernovae are exploding very massive stars, so stars that are more massive than our sun. And they're cool. They're really cool to look at. Like I would just encourage people to like use your favorite search engine and look for Hubble Space Telescope and Supernova and just look at pictures. And you will totally understand why astronomers get real hype about them. It's also the case that understanding supernovae involves understanding nuclear explosions and involves understanding um, explosive mechanisms. So I think at every stage that we're doing this work, we have to ask ourselves, if I solve this equation, what applications does it have here on earth? And who will use this? Particularly since for those of, those of us in academia, we're making our work freely available, which means that nobody has to ask us permission to use our solution to the equation. They'll just find it and use it. So I think that that's a, an example, another one that's clearly very present with us is artificial intelligence. We're starting to use artificial intelligence techniques a lot more to analyze large data sets in particle physics and cosmology. And in fact, one of my um, very good friends, Brian Nord, who's also a black cosmologist, um, is one of the leading experts on this subject. And it's a conversation that Brian and I are constantly having. We also, we collaborate together. I'm starting to use some of the techniques that he's been using. And the conversation we're constantly having is, for this project that we are working on, are any of the tools or ideas we're developing going to take things in such a new direction that they could be, they could have unintended consequences? I'm, we don't train students to think like that. And I will say that I'm, I'm hopeful that I will be better at that with my research group. Um, but it can't depend on individual professors having the thought to do that. It has to be a systematic thing that we make the decision that we are going to teach people to think about ethics. One last question for you. I want to know for the um, 
little kid, we'll say, who's sitting there watching that documentary, right? Um, and today, what kind of advice do you have for them, for kids who wanna break into physics? What do you say? I think it's easy to get the impression from like a documentary um, or a book that science is about what we know, but science is about what we don't know. And so that also means that scientists spend a lot of time feeling confused. So it's okay to feel confused. That's actually a very scientist experience to, to feel confusion. Um, the other thing is, that it's, you know, it's not about the smartest person in the room, whatever that means. The most important quality a scientist can have is a commitment to being persistent and to bearing with discomfort of confusion. And sometimes, you know, a willingness to accept that what you thought was true is wrong. Amazing. Chanda, you've blown my mind again with this interview, just like you did with the book. I absolutely love it. Everyone should run out, grab a copy, read it, follow you on Twitter, follow your career. Congratulations, Mazel tov.